litany of things today. Uh, the deck that I kind of put together today is an amalgamation of several different deep topics uh, that uh, I'm going to talk about at a high level. What I want to make sure that we get across are the things that I personally believe that um, uh, nonprofits in particular need to be good at. And this is a, this is uh, a selfish uh, uh, a selfish thing, but you know it's my talk, so I can do whatever I want. Now, um, if for those that don't know, we do have. Uh, uh, I do not have a background in nonprofits. Uh, my background was a business. I was a business analyst, and uh, I brought on Katie Lord to uh, run our nonprofit division when she convinced me successfully that it was something that we needed to do. And um, if you don't know Katie, she's absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, I highly recommend you get to know her. And if you don't, uh, or if you'd like me to make that introduction, I would be more than happy to do that um, uh, at some point here. So I'm sharing, can everybody see? Yes. Good. Now, um, I'm. Uh, if I'm moving my mouse around, it's because I can only see part of my screen, and I'm looking at you guys too. So, so the three things that I really want to get across today uh, are looking at one: how can you have some basic understanding about how the mind works, so that you can differentiate yourself to be top of mind. That's that's something that is very. I what I found actually to be to be more difficult. It for in the nonprofit sector than the for-profit sector, and I think it's because of how organizations are founded uh, in the nonprofit in the nonprofit sector. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I'm going to show you how we uh, the the lean that we take on on data and how we use emotional data, with the difference between the data that you have that you're probably sitting on in your organization, and what and what emotional data is and how. Uh, not only understanding the place of both of them and how they should operate, but how you can benefit from both. And then the last thing is um, uh, I'm going to show you some tricks of segmentation of how you can use emotional data to connect with your donors in a way that's really kind of cheating. So uh, that's what we're going to we're going to go through today. Um, this is not a uh, you sit there and do whatever you want. Uh, or you sit there and let me talk. You you are completely. I give you absolute freedom to interrupt me, uh, ask me to stop some of this stuff. I'm going to ask you to pull yourself off mute anyway. Um, you don't have to take yourself off camera if you don't want to. But um, uh, especially here in the beginning, we're going to do a little exercise because I'm going to mess with your head and get and get us going. Nobody cares about this stuff. Let's be quite honest. All right. First thing I want you to do is at least think about this at minimum and uh, write it down because it's something you're going to come back to. So why do your donors support you? I'll tell you this is one of my favorite questions uh, because the answer is probably a little bit harder to come up with than you think, even though it's maybe the most important question when it comes to understanding your organization. All right, now don't tell me, because I don't want to know. I want you to think about it later uh, when we run through some stuff. Instead, what I want to do right now is I want to play a game. So everybody take yourself off mute. I don't care if a dog's barking. We've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, eight. I would say if somebody makes it out this afternoon, they should go to the one at the door because I will not be here later. Right. Yeah. So they should just pick up that phone that's right by the front door. Oh. So Molly. Phones, we'll All right. Get, so here's what, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you an idea. But tomorrow morning, this is the number because I will be sitting. All right. I got Molly. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to give you an idea. All right. And then what I want you to do is tell me what brand I'm talking about. Okay. We understand this game, Nod? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first one is a little bit easier. But if I give you the idea of online search, the brand I'm talking about is Google. Google. Right. Excellent work. What if I'm talking about expensive coffee? Who am I talking about? Starbucks. Starbucks. All right. What about greeting cards? Walmart. 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 
And if I'm talking about Big Burrito, I'm probably oh, talking about oh, 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 <laughs> All right. Uh, low prices. Walmart. Walmart. Costco. Never. Online auction. Who am I talking about? Okay. 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 And if I'm talking about an expensive watch, I'm probably talking about Rolex. Rolex. And what about online books? Amazon. 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 Oh, interesting. Hmm. So uh, what about soft drink? Coca-Cola. Coca and jeans. I'm talking about Levi's. And what about affordable airline? Which one am I talking about? Southwest. 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 Yeah. And fried chicken is Kentucky. Kentucky. Kentucky fried chicken. All right. So who can tell me what just happened? It was kind of interesting. Well, they're good at building their brand. We know it. Quick association. Quick association. There was one exception. Does anybody know who it was? I know who it was. It was Janice. Janice, what did you say? Uh, in terms of, of why? No, you, uh, said, you said one that was wrong. Not that I said one, the name that was wrong. I said Costco. Yeah. Is that a Walmart? Yeah. And why, and who, what happened that was really interesting about, uh, what, what about, what about what you said? Did, any, did anybody pick up on? Did you say it right away? You don't like getting divided in places? Actually, I think she's right. I think the new, the new uh, low price leader is Costco, but the old one, the one that's been established uh -huh. for years is Walmart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it took you. You didn't say it right away. Everybody said Walmart, and then there was like one Mississippi, two Mississippi, <laughs> three Mississippi, and then you went Costco. Now, John, you might be right about that too. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Southwest hasn't been the most affordable airline for over a decade. Wow. Wow. Aren't you guys, I thought this was a smart crew, Jenny. What's happening? I thought, hmm. So what do we think happened here? Because some of these aren't true. I mean, there's no such thing as a right answer. You just had this association with an idea. You said what affordable. Happened? And if you, I think it said low budget, we may have answered the airline differently. You may have. We'll never know. Now, what I did is I just cheated and I tricked you with big and obvious brands. But the point is that your brain operates like a file cabinet, right? And what happens is it, per, it puts certain pieces of information in the, uh, and stores it to have visceral recall. Now, your brain does this with everything not just brands, it does it with people, it does it with ideas, it does it with pieces of information, it does it with history, it does it with emotions, it does it with everything. Now, if you understand how this works, you can take advantage of it. Now, why would you wanna do that? Because the idea is when it comes to your organization and or uh, what is I think called philanthropic priority, everyone wants to be number one. If you don't wanna be number one and you don't want your organization to be top of mind in your philanthropic priority, then we have deeper things we need to talk about. So a lot of this, a lot of this came uh, from a dude named Jean Piaget, who basically was an epistemologist, which just means study of knowledge or language. And what he did was uh, stole a bunch of ideas from Immanuel Kant, and essentially just kind of wrote them down. One of those is a schema. So that's what just happened. Your brain creates these schemas, right? And they're basically just shortcuts that exist. And the reason that happens is because we can't, we can't just think about the things that we're doing all the time, because if we do, uh, we never actually accomplish anything. So for instance, if we were like, right hand move up, right hand move down, we'd be like zombies. We would, and, and so what happens is your brain creates these shortcuts. Um, uh, and uh, so for instance, like I'm sure many of us have driven home from somewhere. And then the next thing you knew you were home and you were like, holy crap, I took like three turns. And I don't know, that's kind of scary. I, like maybe the light was green. Holy crap, did I run a stop sign? No, you probably did everything fine, but your brain took care of these things for you. It was a complicated schema you've done many times. Schematic markers, on the other hand, are things that are emotive that your brain remembers. Now, your brain remembers emotive information much, much easier than it remembers other things. 
uh, kind of like how you can remember someone's voice, right? And you're like, don't even know why, but you can like recognize voices and, and, and why people's faces are uniquely different. But data and dates sometimes we don't do a very good job of remembering unless you're on a kind of a bell curve spectrum as far as being able to uh, your brain operate that way. But these are important things to remember because you want your brain to create or other people's brains to create schematic markers and schemas to remember who you are. Because if you do that, you will win more organic business, you will get more donations, and people will think of you more without you having to spend any money to remind them to do that, which is ideal, yes? We don't wanna be reminding people all the time who we are, it's extraordinarily expensive. So when I said your brain operates like a file cabinet, it kinda of does. Now, what's fun is when I get to talk to high school kids when they're going to college. And I give them a similar talk and I say, a file cabinet is a huge metal box and it has a handle on it. And you grab it and you pull it out and there's paper inside. And so let's think about what happens when we're opening a file cabinet. Where do your eyes immediately go? Tabs. The tabs, correct. The front. What are the types of things that are written on tabs? What's in the folder? Right? What are those things typically? Subjects, topics, hot, hot one-liners. Example might be like bills, right? Client like names. Mm -hmm. So what do all the things that you would write on a tab all kind of have in common? Well, I'll just tell you so it's easier. They're all objective. Meaning what? Who can tell me what the difference between objective and subjective? Perfect. Objective means it's the same in everybody's head. A date is the same in everybody's head. A name, for the most part, is the same in everybody's head. You don't write subjective things on file folders. If you do, you will go insane and so will everyone else around you. So for instance, if you put favorite donor or, or, or favorite clients on a tab, no one would know what's in there, including yourself after a, after a short time. So your mind works the exact same way. It has to understand something that is objective and it's called an objective hook. And your brain is constantly looking through this information, trying to figure out what it, the heck are we talking about here in order for that file to be open so that we can start stuffing information into it. If you are not talking about something that is objective, you are essentially just swirling around information inside someone's brain. Unfortunately, we are taught when we communicate to be very flowery with our language. And unfortunately, that is not how our dumb, dumb brain operates. So for instance, you yourselves engage in um, objectivity when you are listening to someone else's pitch. Imagine you're meeting someone for the first time, you're at a networking event or a coffee or something, and they're telling you what you do a lot of times you will objectively communicate back to them what they're saying. Oh, so you're an insurance agent and you insure boats. To which point the insurance agent would probably be like, I mean, I guess if you wanna say it like that, because you just insulted them by objectifying what they do into its most base principle. And they shouldn't be insulted. They should be, they should be high-fiving you for making their life easier because now you just created a file inside of your brain called insurance person with boats. <laughs> now, that is really, really good for this individual because now you have visceral recall. Every time, so the next, so let's say that you're on a boat six months later, you will remember this person and, you, and you'll be like, don't even care about insurance. But like you're trying to connect with the person that owns the boat and be like, you know, I know a guy that you should probably know. He insures boats. You just made money for this person. It's ridiculous. And all we did was take advantage of how the brain naturally operates. So this is the type of way you need to be thinking about how you're communicating your organization. I.e., if you're using subjective communication, you are losing money. If you're using objective communication, you are using how the brain naturally operates to your advantage. Make a sense? All right, now let's talk about emotions for a second. We gotta talk about this dude um, who looks exactly like a neuroscientist. It actually looks like we sort of just Googled neuroscientist and grabbed the first picture because that is what Antonio Damasio looks like. He, 
He's a, he is a neuroscientist at USC. Um, he got very, very lucky and he fell kind of backwards into this um, uh, 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 a very interesting um, hypothesis. He was studying people that had had um, brain trauma and there were certain parts of their pituitary glands that were, that were uh, damaged. They weren't allowed, these people couldn't excrete certain emotions, right? Like basic stuff, ner uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, things like that. And um, what he found was that uh, these people were almost completely unable to make basic decisions. And so he hypothesized all these things about consciousness and about how consciousness essentially exists inside of the emotive sectors of our brain, which is the limbic system of the brain, right? Let's talk about some of this stuff. Uh, that we think we have sort of like two like hemispheres of the brain sort of, it's like kind of, it's like kind of like that. We have the logic brain, which is the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex. That's like the part of our brain that does really smart stuff. Like uh, it uh, does math problems, complex decision making. It's, and it's very slow. If you've ever read a book called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, very famous um, uh, behavioral economist, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, he, uh, he figured out that the logic brain, the smart part of the brain, works super duper duper slow. And the emotive brain, which is the limbic system and uh, it, it's uh, uh, responsible for all kinds of stuff, it works really, really quickly. For really no other purpose than it, that, that part of our brain's job is to keep us alive. And actually those two pieces of the brain sort of don't, uh, they don't really even collide that often. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things that um, Antonio Damasio figured out that was wildly significant is that as a species, we don't use the smart part of our brain when we make decisions. Like even highly logical major decisions in our life. I mean, think about when you go buy a car, same type, like same part of the brain you use when you're ordering a sandwich. If that's not frustrating, it friggin' should be because that's unbelievable, but it's sort of true. I mean, think about when you buy a car, you like trick yourself into thinking that you're being logical even though you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm driving this car. Like this, this car is a, is a representation of me in a vehicle form, right? But you sound like an idiot if you communicate that to people too, right? Like if someone, like for instance, number one response, someone says, hey, you got a new car. What do you say? Yeah, I got a, got a great deal on it. Well, you know, got a new job. And so I need a little bit of gas mileage. Logic, 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 logic. We justify our decisions and the things that we do with logic so that we don't sound like an idiot. Because we're afraid that if we say, yeah, I don't know, I just kind of got behind the wheel and it felt right. Or yeah, this is um, really like, I want you to think that I'm successful and therefore I'm trying this. Or do you remember when you got a BMW like two years ago and I can't stop thinking about it. So now I got one. You can't say these things, it's not socially responsible. So. A lot of times the data that we get back, for instance, when we're communicating with people, whether you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a donor or you're, um, uh, uh, or you're having just a, a conversation with a spouse or a friend, a lot of times the stuff you're getting is not totally true. So one of the things I want you to think about is um, how the brain processes information when it comes in. So I want to point particular to the amygdala here. The amygdala is responsible for basically all the information that's coming into our brain. And this many times is what happens. Uh, when we are putting together our communication for our organization, we typically talk about the fancy pants type of stuff that we do. Why? Because for some dumb reason, we believe, uh, or your brain believes, that complexity equals value. Let me tell you how cool this thing is. And we talk directly to that frontal lobe, um, which is we use smart words and we use big words and we use, uh, we use language that is like marketing language or terms of art because we want them to think that we know what we're talking about and it makes us sound smart. Uh, uh, the problem is, is that part of the brain doesn't even process information. The way that information comes and it comes through the amygdala of the brain right into the limbic system. And that limbic system is like your dumb, dumb brain, which is where all of your decisions are made, by the way. And the dumb, dumb brain is going, I don't understand any of this crap. And if it does, you just, something bad happens, which means that it, the amygdala sends the information to your brainstem. And the brainstem is gonna do one of two things. It's, it's fight or flight. You've heard fight or flight? That's where fight or flight happens. Now, if you're trying to convince someone to give you money or you're trying to make a sale of some kind, did you win either way? You lost, 100% chance of loss. 
they're either fighting you and then you got to play a position of defense, which you're probably not going to win, or they're just bailing. So instead, we have to talk to the, uh, the amygdala of the brain, which means we need to talk in a very dumb, dumb way. The more simple and stupid, lowest common denominator way that we can communicate to people, the more or the higher the probability that we're going to be accepted. So if we're trying to convince someone to do something, we need to be great big dum-dums and we need to be very objective with what we're saying. And as long as those two things are happening, you are in really good shape. The, the amygdala says, hey, that's not threatening to my worldview because if it's threatening to my worldview, I'm sending you down to the brainstem or I don't understand all them big words. And so I'm sending that down to the brainstem. If you say, uh, hey, look, I'm just an insurance guy and I insure people that own boats. The amygdala's like, yeah, I got that. I know what a boat is. I know what insurance is. I'm on board here. That was an unintended pun, by the way, because I made the boat thing up. That was not planned, just so you know. So it, 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 a lot of the times we're doing the exact opposite of what we should be doing when we're, when, we're ba when we're doing basic communications with people. Don't talk about your features and benefits. People don't buy features and benefits. Bad salespeople, especially think about a car salesman, a bad car salesman will start rattling off the features and benefits. You know, it's got 300 horsepower and electric. I bought a car. It's been a while since I bought a car. I was probably like five or six years ago. The guy actually said it has air conditioning. <laughs> How is this a feature still? Sidebar. But the point is, is like, I didn't buy the car because it has 300 horsepower or because it has air conditioning, right? There are a whole litany of other emotions that were going on. A good salesperson will probably use Socratic method. And they'll say something like, how fast do you really need to go? Now that is a great sales question. Or... Um, maybe, maybe I'm able to ascertain when I'm talking to this person that they have a family. Then maybe my question is not, do you know we have anti-lock wheels and uh, we have all kinds of, we have the best seatbelts and we have airbags go, how safe do you need your family to be? Because that, the answer to that question is going to dictate what kind of vehicle you need to drive. You've just sold that person. It doesn't matter. Like we know if, if safety is important to that person, we've hit that emotional cord and the rest of the sale will take care of itself. We make a sense? All right, so the trick here is how do you actually gather that data? Because uh, every organization is sitting on data right now to some extent, um, and it's behavioral data. So for instance, if you're looking at a donor list, you've got your donor, maybe their names, maybe how much they donate annually, or the dates that they've given, the events that they've attended, this is, your, this is your data set, your database. So all that's behavioral. So if you're to look at that, what we're, what we're kind of forced to do as leaders is if we want to accomplish something, like if we want to, if we want to hold an event, um, maybe what we'll say as a leader is we'll say, hey, let's go back and pull all of our donors that have attended events in the last three years, and we'll start there. Or, hey, let's go back and start with the people that have um, sponsored an event or... Or, or something like that in the last five years. And we'll start with them when we're trying to find somebody that's going to, or if we're trying to build up our, um, our sponsorships uh, for a specific event. That makes total sense. Now, do we know anything about these people from a data perspective, other than the fact they've done it in the past? We have no idea. We may have some qualitative type of information because we may have a personal relationship with these people. We might know they're a bank, Right, or we may know, or we might know that they're a, a manufacturing company or something. But other than that, um, if you handed this off to someone to go do something with, they don't know, they don't know anything. So what we call um, uh, what we call that is we, that's big data, right? It, it, you know, quant essentially. This is behavioral information that you can use for lots of great things, which I'll talk about in a second. But it doesn't tell you the most important thing, which is. What am I supposed to say to them to get them to actually do something? And that's the really tri tricky part. And that is essentially what emotional data is. We define it as a combination of qualitative and quantitative measurements. Uh, it helps us understand the preferences, the motivations, and the emotions of people that explain the behaviors. 
the behaviors are easy to track for the most part, right? So imagine you're a coffee shop um, or, or, or you're maybe just looking at your own website. You can see for the most part, all of the who, what, when, where, how data, which is what we call big data, right? Big data is who's coming in, what are they doing? When were they there? How do they get there? All that information is readily available. It's easy to gather. Um, it's, they call it indiscriminate, right? Which, is, uh, which means that essentially it's kind of all over the place. It's not wildly organized. It measures and quantifies behaviors. The tricky part is that it is very difficult to make actionable. A lot of times the best you can do is look at the past and really cross your fingers and hope that the past is indicative of the future. And many times it's, many times it's not. Um, what, we, what we really need to know, on the other hand, is uh, we need to understand the emotional data around that individual. And so what is that emotional data? Well, instead of just knowing that they sponsored two years ago, all you really need to know as a leader is, why the hell did they sponsor in the first place? What was that thing? And if you know what that thing is, uh, because it's not static, it's not the same for probably any of the people that sponsor. It's all little different things. And some of them are, by the way, are wildly insulting. Some of them are like you, and it's the part where you're like, well, I guess if you want to, if, yeah, I guess, but you should really be in love with us. That's why you should do this, right? That's what we really want. Uh, if we're especially the leader of a nonprofit uh, and they may not be, it's important to know that. And that's okay. It's your organization. You can take their money or not. It's, it's up to you, but, the, but we need to know this information. So it's really hard to gather this data, unfortunately. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's typically finite in that it's used for a specific purpose, typically, when you are gathering it. Imagine uh, being able to go and have a series of conversations with, 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 with donors, right, or sponsors or, or, or whatever. You're getting information from those people. It's anecdotal. It's not written down, not trackable, not organized. It's very, it's very, very tricky to work with. Um, so uh, it's, it's an area that we focus all of our attention because uh, it, it, at our company because uh, emotional data is, is something that's new. It's not perfect. Uh, it will be the future. Um, it's where everything, everything's trying, everybody's trying to figure out how to do this well. Um, we try to do it in our own heads. We take objective uh, information, the who, what, when, where, how, and we make a hypothesis based on that information as to why something happened. But it's just a hypothesis. You could be right or you could be wrong. We really don't know. Um, but there are ways to gather that kind of emotional data. So I want you to just think of like, if you look at these two different things, if you look in many ways, they are wildly opposite. Um, so the, I only tell you this because I want you to realize that there are two total different uh, data sets that you have at your organization. And uh, the probability of you having emotional data is probably zero. It's probably behavioral, but I want you to make sure and go back and look and segment. If you look at the fields that exist inside of your database, run through those with this new filter on and say, is this a piece of big data or is this a piece of emotional data? Because if you do have some emotional data in there, um, you need to make sure and call it out, carve it out and, um, and, and, and run some queries and analyze it because there's probably some good stuff in there. Um, if you have survey data or where you have open-ended information, if you haven't databased that information uh, or put it into fields, you need to be doing that. Um, it's, uh, uh, so some of this is kind of just DIY stuff. So again, think about who, what, when, where, how is your big data and your emotional data is your why data. Um, uh, I, I wanna sh give you an example uh, of how if you have this information, uh, how valuable it is to your organization. Uh, how many people here uh, currently do segmentation of their database? Create segments. Leslie, very good. If you, I don't want to put you on the spot. You don't have to answer if you don't want, but what, what are types of things that you segment? So um, I use constant contact and um, we have uh, charity partners who have signed up for our site. So we have that as a segment. Good. There are donors, um, there are partner organizations. So just kind of um, segmenting it out like that. That's good. So here's one thing that I want you to, to keep in mind when it comes to segmentation. Most of the time, 
organizations segment their uh, database based on predefined parameters. And a lot, I can call them Facebook parameters because that's what most people do. It's like male, female, uh, you know, how long have they been a donor? Um, how, you know, what's their annual level of giving? Uh, and these things are important, but you can create a segment uh, of your database in any, you can make eye color, height, as there are no limitations. It's your information. All you have to be able to do is find out a way to uh, create those segments. And it's not as hard as you may think. Um, uh, when, you are, when you do a survey, for instance, if you're doing just a generic uh, survey, you're trying to get an NPS score or you're trying to get people's reactions to an event or trying to figure out if they're gonna give you a capital campaign, you can create these segments uh, with the data that you're pulling and the questions that you're asking in that survey. So, um, it, it, and typically in this, you should let your intuition work because if you believe that uh, uh, dog ownership, regardless of what your nonprofit does, right? doesn't matter. If you believe that dog ownership is a, is a potential segment that could be important, you should create that segment. It's not gonna hurt anything. And if you can run data and you can run, uh, if you run surveys and you segment those and you look and you can see that, holy cow, there's a big difference between somebody that owns a dog and somebody that doesn't own a dog. That's unbelievable. Well, now we can uh, do what Leslie's done, which is in, instead of segmenting our audience by um, an event that they uh, have come to or given to, uh, we can do it by dog ownership. And if you, are, if you are sophisticated enough or you use one of our systems where you can go and identify, hey, uh, actually somebody that owns a dog is twice as likely to give, your intuition could be totally spot on. And you may have just stumbled on a potential competitive advantage. Because if, you're, if, you've been, if your intuition has led you to believe that dog ownership is significant and you can now segment by that, you now know something that no one else knows. It can be wildly valuable. We see organizations that are typically very, very agile and they grow very, very quickly. They do not play by other people's rules. They do not segment their database by age. They don't segment it by, I mean, they might, but they don't pay attention to it. They don't segment them by gender or giving. They have these weird, weird, weird ones. So one of my favorites, just to show you an example, there's a company in Washington that, uh, that created this really, really awesome uh, uh, subscription box company. And I can't remember the name of it, uh, Box for Mom maybe was what it was called. And, and essentially it was, it was, the product was very, very well engineered. And what, what it was, was it was, if your mom was by herself or she was in a home or something, they would, it would arrive at her, it would, it would be shipped to her every month and it would have activities and things and then you could, you could customize it and you could even include like pictures of kids and, and, and things so that it was like personalized for her, but also personalized with family stuff. It was a great product. And one of, the, one of the things that they were focused on was we want to find people that live a long way away from their mom because we believe that that is a great target segment for us, which makes total sense. And they said, the problem is, is we can't get it off the ground. Well, we actually found out, we said, hey, awesome, cool. We can test that segment. We tested a segment and found out that not only were they, they were right, but they were completely wrong. The, the, the segment was correct, but they had it backwards. And we said, uh, actually, when we looked at the distance that someone lives, we created it, we made it up. Like how many miles? Make it up. Like one mile, 20 miles, 100 miles, 500 miles. We made up what those segments were, but we found that people were most more likely to buy that box if mom lived really, really close. And that led to, oh, this is not a mom, I love you brand. This is a, I feel guilty because I don't come and see you enough because we live in the same town brand. And so they experimented with this really great segment and it became wildly significant. And they went with their gut and their intuition on it. And they just did something a little bit different than what Facebook tells them to do because there's no button on Facebook that says, I want to target people that live this far away from their mom. They had to figure out a way to do it. But once you have that, you now have a sustainable competitive advantage for your organization. So this is the way you need to be thinking about how, how to do this. 
So um, I want to show you an example of how uh, using emoti uh, emotional data is, uh, is, is actionable in, 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 and you should be thinking about how you segment people in different ways. And if you're measuring them, uh, now we, we, created our own, we created our own metric for this, um, but that doesn't mean that you, that, that doesn't mean you can't kind of do some of these things on your own. But this was something that a client came to us with. They, they had a founder and that founder was getting old and the founder had a lot of rich friends and they were very concerned about the failing health of the founder. And if the founder passed away, would all these rich people stop giving? It was something they were very concerned about. So I just want to show you a couple of very, uh, so there's a little bit of an eye chart. You don't have to worry too much about it. But what I want to want you to see here is this is just a sampling. And this is our little, this is our, our metric that we came up with. But again, you don't have to, you can use anything you want. But what we're able to do is when we broke, oops, as we broke this data out, we were able to see when we tested the idea of having a personal connection to the founder, uh-oh, these long donors that have been giving, and we knew that these were the donors that were giving for a long time, for having given these big chunks of money. They didn't really even care about any of the things that the organization does, like the, the mission, and, the, and it, it was irrelevant. It was all about uh, their friend. So we said, there's good news and bad news here, y'all. The bad news is you should totally plan on these people not giving once the founder passes away. And that's crappy news, but at least you know, and at least we have some data to verify it so that we're not holding out hope, right? It gives us a sense of what's probable, what, what, is, what is likely and what is probable. So um, just understand that, uh, and one of the things too is they were kind of terrified because there was so much money coming from these few folks that um, if, uh, it, when they were seeing in their communication, they were so, they were so paranoid about what these people would think if they didn't want to offend them or say the wrong thing. And the good news for them was you don't have to worry about it. You can say anything you want. It doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with the organization. It has to do with this person. There's probably like a tip or tat thing there, right? Like this person probably gives to their, their thing in exchange of millions and millions of dollars, a world that, you know, maybe none of us will never <laughs> really truly understand, right? Or live in for the most part. But that's probably the reality of what's happened. The good news is, since you guys have really gotten um, serious about onboarding new donors, they're completely in line with the mission and the values of what it is you're doing, and they don't care about the founder, right? So um, great job, keep doing what you're doing, and hopefully by the time, uh, by the time uh, this founder does pass, you've been able to onboard enough new donors that the organization uh, won't be in bad shape. Um, and um, uh, so it was a way that you can use some of this data to get a very clear insight on what people's motivations are and what's important to them so that you can make, a sh a sh a, a, you can make the right strategic decisions without having to worry about uh, waste or, uh, by the way, makes sleeping easier too, by the way. Uh, does that make sense? And how you, can, how you can get some of that data is really like we always say survey. And if you're not an expert in surveying, that's fine. You kind of don't have to be. Start simple. You should be talking to your people anyway. Um, anybody, can run a, anybody can run a survey. Um, we, we happen to be super nerds at it, but that doesn't mean that, that, that you can't DIY and really uh, get smart and intentional about understanding the emotions of, uh, of, of your people. So the, I want to uh, wrap here with a, a short little um, talk that's important for nonprofits uh, uh, in particular, I think, to understand. And it's about, uh, it's about fear. Now, uh, nonprofits, I think, are faced with more fear than, than, than for-profit organizations. And it's for several reasons. One, most of them aren't sustainable, uh, meaning they don't have enough uh, guaranteed revenue to come in the door that can sustain the, the organization for the long term. We have to make sure that we have grants that we're taking care of. We have to make sure that we're taking care of our donors. And a lot of times we live in fear of what happens if we lose a donor or what happens if, if this happens or what happens if we don't have this event. This event makes up 25% of our annual revenue and boy, we just got smoked in COVID. Uh, and and uh, I, 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 want to, um, I want everyone to know that not only is, is that fear normal, but that uh, it's a, in many ways can actually be um, uh, 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 alleviated by 
doing some of the things that I've talked about today. One, be objective with your communication. If you're objective and you're simple, you can stand out in the brain and you can be stuck in there for a long time, like 10 years past <laughs> affordable airline. It really, your brain is not that complicated of an organism when it comes to remembering things. So if you can differentiate and communicate yourself in a way to someone, to someone that is, does not use flowery language, but communicates in ideas and concepts instead of um, sales or marketing language, you are communicating to the brain in a way that it really understands. So um, I, I want you to, uh, the, 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 I want to just talk about the hypothalamus first. I don't want to talk about the hypothalamus. Again. There's a hypothalamus. You've got it and everybody else has it. All right. So even, uh, even these gazelles have it. So here's something uh, that we are genetically predisposed to do, and it's called homogeny. We are pack animals, um, just like these gazelle. We want to uh, gravitate towards each other because we know that the probability of our survival is increased when we are in packs. It's the reason that we have cities and um, we aren't a bunch of nomads fighting over the same uh, you know, food source. And the, uh, but the, the, the success that you have in creating objective emotional differentiation for your brand and what your brain wants you to do are typically the exact opposite of each other. So, uh, which is sort of frustrating, but, but this will make sense, hopefully. Imagine you're watching this scene on TV. You're flipping through the channels, as it were, um, which that's going to be gone one of these days. You guys ever think about that? The idea of flipping through the channels is going to be like waiting by the phone. It's just going to, it's not going to make sense anymore. But imagine you're flipping through the channels and this, this scene comes up and there's like the drums or whatever it is. And uh, we're all, we, and you kind of like, ah, oh, like, why can't I, why can't I change the channel? Because you're waiting for this very particular type of moment. What moment essentially are we waiting for as human beings? It's okay, you can say it. The commercials? The commercials? Did you say the commercials? Yeah. Leslie, you are officially a weirdo. <laughs> Who waits for the commercials? Well, I thought you meant you're waiting, I don't know, to flip to something else until there's a commercial. Never mind. I was thinking differently. I probably asked a crappy question. I bet there are commercial nerds, and maybe you are one of those people. I just learned something new about Leslie. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I can't so, be. So what are you waiting for, right? You're watching this scene, and something's going to happen. What's going to happen? The lion's going to eat one. Lion's going to eat one, right? So... Yes, thank you, Kat, you're exactly right. We're waiting for this moment, essentially. Now, if you are a nerd, you know that uh, typically it's the lionesses that make the kill because the man does nothing. You make your own comment on that. But it's also not as impressive of a picture. So I don't use that. Uh, but yes, you're waiting for the kill. Now, here is something that um, I want you to keep in mind. These gazelle are not wildly different from us. And when they're filming this, there's a very specific moment that they're waiting for. And I'll tell you what it is. Uh, they are waiting for someone. A, uh, so when they're filming, they don't know. A lot of times they don't know where the lion is. They have no idea. Uh, they, uh, because these things are pretty good hunters. Sometimes they're lucky enough to have a crew that's following it. But most of the time when they're doing the cut scenes, they're filmed like months apart right? Where well, they got great film of the lions and then they, and they, and a lot of times the kill sets aren't as good, right? A lot of times it's just movie magic. So uh, uh, what they'll do is they'll train these camera people to, to basically just follow when the gazelle, when a gazelle breaks from the pack. And the reason they're trained to do that is because it increases the probability of them catching the kill shot because they know that the lion, one of the lions is going to jump out of a tall thing of grass and it's going to get one of the, one of the straggle, one of the, one of the stragglers. Your brain fundamentally understands this relationship as well, i.e. stay in the pack, uh, do the thing that everyone else is doing because it mathematically increases your chances of survival, which is, which is sort of true, right? At a base fundamental 
dumb, dumb brain level, which is where all of your decisions are made, fat down in this reptilian brain. And that part of your brain's job is not to do engineering or write poetry or do a math problem. It's to keep you alive. Fundamentally, that's the job of your brain is to keep you alive. That's all it's trying to do. And separating from the pack decreases your probability of survival. Therefore, no good. It will release neurotoxins into your brain if you separate from the pack, i.e., if you say something that is different or unusual from other organizations similar to yours, it is dangerous. The great irony is that the brain is trained to see things that are different for the same reason. It's trying to find if there's a threat. So your brain is keenly aware in looking for things that are different and ignoring homogeny. So on one side, your brain's saying, for the love of God, don't do anything different or you'll die. And on the other hand, your brain's saying, if you don't do anything different, no one will ever see you. It's sort of true. And I believe this fundamental dichotomy that exists here in the brain is the reason that most organizations look identical to each other. It's the exact opposite of how good economies and good organizations operate. You absolutely have to step out on a limb and be dangerous and do something that no one else has done. Most of the time we're so petrified and terrified that we're going to offend someone or we're going to lose a particular donor that we don't do it. And we stay in that pack of homogeny and we never accomplish anything great. Your brain is much more comfortable keeping you in the status quo, even if that status quo is uncomfortable, then it is doing something different. That's how strong this instinct is. So anytime you try to do something different, and I'm talking about We've been doing this. We've been doing this, uh, this, 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 this annual campaign the same for the last ten years. When you try to change something, your brain will fight you tooth and nail, and you will lose sleep over it. Even if you're changing something stupid, like the name, like like the subtext of the name, or or like where the location is going to be, things that are fairly irrelevant, you will your brain will release these neurotoxins. It absolutely hates it. What you have to remember that the fear that exists is the lion. The lion does not exist in our reality. We are, are the, the, the lion essentially is just that part of your brain releasing fear and that is it. There is absolutely nothing to be afraid of. And if you don't step out on a limb and you don't do something different, you will remain a part of the pack and you will not do anything great. And more importantly, you will never ever be an organization that is at the front of this presentation that anyone will ever remember because you simply won't. So if you take away nothing else from this organization or from this presentation, please remember that. And I have a couple of minutes for questions, unless Jane tells me otherwise, because she's the boss. No, um, anybody have any questions for Grant? I don't know that I have a, a question exactly. I mean, maybe I do, but um, I mean, first of all, I just wanna make a quick comment in that I had um, an instructor in a fundraising class that said, um, people don't give to causes, they give to people with causes. And, um, and I've found that to be true, at least in the beginning stages of Reuseful and that um, I've been very humbled by the fact that people have given money because it's something that I started um, and they, they value that. Um, but my question is, um, years ago when I was a technical writer, I was in a, a, a workshop and the, the kind of the icebreaker was um, the instructor said, I want everybody to um, remember the very first thing they thought of when I say this word um, and, and then, you know, you're going to report that out. And, and the word was dog. And so he went on to say, okay, who thought of a, big, of a specific breed? Come over here. Who thought of an emotion? Come over here. Um, you know, who thought of a sound to come over here. And so pretty soon, you know, this room was filled with these groups of people um, who all thought very differently about this, what, what might seem to be an objective word. And so um, I just guess I, you know, it, it's good to think about objectivity in the, through the lens of those segments, I guess, um, is, is kind of what occurred to me during this, um, 
this webinar. So I just wonder if you had any thoughts about that, Grant. The fact that your brain does that is very good news for all of us. Because if your brain didn't do that, creating differentiation would be impossible. But the fact that some people thought of a breed and some people thought of an emotion or a memory related to a dog is the reason that you can do this. You can, uh, your brain will, uh, uh, objectivity can be given to anything. For instance, affordable is not objective. It's subjective, but it became objective in your head. You can make things that are subjective objective if you do it correctly. So um, uh, that, so, there's a, there's a whole other talk that I do on branching uh, where we essentially correlate how you communicate yourself to a tree. Um, and it's, uh, a, it's very impactful because if you say dog, think about dog as the trunk of a tree. Well, there, what would be the branches then? Well, one branch could be breed. And then there could be lots of little branches from the breed, which are actual specific breeds. You can create a nonprofit on a on a rescue, uh, we are a rescue organization that only works with uh, dogs that weigh over 70 pounds. And that level of specificity will create strong emotional connections with a segment of the population that likes big dogs. And you can make, and first of all, that'd be a funny brand, right? You could, you could essentially just use the whole thing and make fun of uh, people that like small dogs. That could be the whole thing. Right, like, and, and, and all you're doing is you're building emotional resonance based on the size of an animal. You can do it with anything. You just have to abstract for a second and think about the fact that any segment can be a, a, a position. Grant, so when you are able to come up with some of these um, emotional segments, mm -hmm. how do you measure it? How do you, you can come up with these easily, uh, for donors, but then how do you as an organization, for example, work with a not-for-profit besides surveying to come up with that, um, that data? So uh, one of the first things that we do is um, we, we basically tap into the brain of everybody in the organization. And because, let me tell you something, hardly ever do we see something that comes out of left field. There, there, uh, whatever that, there, there is a reason that people, um, are, are giving to you. And it may not, it may not be everybody, but there are basic fundamental things and you know what they are. It's not, the challenge isn't figuring out what they are. The challenge is figuring out, are there certain groups of people that have, that feel a certain way and other groups that think another certain way. Here's a great example. Um, we just did this work with uh, a, well, you know, but the social services work. And one of the things that they said is we said, you know what we, we always kind of fight with is like the, the, the feed a fish or teach to fish thing. And, um, but we don't really know, like, is there a difference between the two? So we, so we, we, we ran our survey and it came back and, and through our segmentation, we found that there was a stark dichotomy that existed between those two, those two lines of thought. And what it was, was all of their volunteers, I mean, with almost without, without an exception were teach a fish type of people. And almost all of their donors were give a fish people. Well, this is a very, very important segment for them because it's kind of like, if you've ever thought about when you send out a certain communication, like an email communication and you get a certain response and then you send out another one that's maybe a little bit different and you get like a different response and you're always scratching your head going, how come I can't hit, you know, how come I can't hit a home run here? It's not because you're not seeing the right things. It's that you're, you're saying the right thing to some and the wrong thing to others. And it's just hard to figure that out. In this instance, it was clear through our segmentation analysis, it's through segmentation that we were able to figure out, hey, look, so now they separate their database and they say totally different things when they're talking to volunteers and potential volunteers, it changed how they recruit and, and a bunch of other things. And when then donors, again, totally different. And it explained why in many ways it was very challenging for them to convert a volunteer into a donor because it was these two totally different ethoses that they had about how to solve the problem, right? Mm -hmm. The universe, kind of universal problem for the social service. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, Grant, do you have a few more minutes? I think so. Okay, John um, posted some questions in the chat. Um, can you see that or would you like me to read them? No, I'm sorry. I have my thing. Can I turn my thing off? Yeah, you can turn your thing off. 
All right. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, how can we measure affinity within the data we have? John, help me understand what you mean by affinity. Um, connections. Um, affinity being part of the group, being part of our cause, being part of the group that supports our cause. Okay. Um, is that a term of art? Remember, I'm not a, I'm not a non I'm not a, non I'm a learning nonprofit person. Katie, Katie has to, uh, use <laughs> kid gloves with me. So, uh, their families and friends. So I'm not sure I completely understand what affinity is. Affinity would sort of be what you would gauge as their connection to your organization. Does that help? Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Now I understand your question. Okay. So the answer is it's extremely tricky. Um, we can't, one of the things that we were, we found out is that we cannot rely on people's existing data sets. And even when people keep really good data uh, or they have really clean fields and they're super confident, it's not as though we can go scrape through behavior and identify emotion or motivation. And it's because those two things essentially are uncorrelated. Um, you know, uh, now if it's me, uh, you know, uh, gr uh, you can use big data and aggregate big data uh, with, with the existing sets that you have in order to maybe mold and modify behavior over time. But it's really tricky because that's all we know is the behavior, right? Like if you're a coffee shop and you're, I use coffee shops as an example, it's really simple. If you're a coffee shop and you know that there's this person that comes in every day and they order the same thing, your big data can like be, you can use it to be predictive and you can have that drink waiting for them, right? And, th and that's, and you can use it to uh, maximize margins and be super efficient, but we really have no idea why that person's coming in. So uh, we don't have that data set. All we have is essentially what those behaviors are. So we're forced to sort of assert or hypothesize what that emotion is based on the behavior. They're typically just uncorrelated. Like, it's tough to change someone's behavior by or trying to modify their behavior based on just understanding their behavior. But if you know why they're doing certain things, right, then it's a lot easier to change their behavior. Because if you're trying to get someone, that person that comes in and gets that same latte every day to buy a muffin, if they've never bought a muffin, any answer is correct. You have no idea, like you just try anything. But if you know that they're coming in before they go to work, Maybe you can have your barista say, hey, is there anybody else in your office? There is. Well, um, we have muffins that are 20% uh, off uh, if you buy a latte. And you can bring that, even though you don't want it, you can bring that muffin in for your person. You'll probably make a new best friend. Right? So we just used a piece of qualitative information to modify someone's behavior based on something that we know. So a lot of times, well, a lot of times, every time, we have to go create this data set ourselves because it doesn't exist in existing data. If it did, someone would be a bajillionaire because they would go through and scrape. I mean, you guys think about, you guys use the uh, um, wealth engines. I'm sort of learning about the scraping and the wealth <laughs> engine. That's super beneficial stuff, right? So you can see if someone owns a boat or has a vacation house or what other organizations they've given to. And you can go, okay, well, this person gives a lot to animals, right? They give into ASPCA and they give to whatever. So. I'm gonna talk about animals just as a rapport building exercise with them. That's your best case scenario. And you just really cross your fingers and hope that that was like not their spouse and it was them. And you talk about animals and it, it totally misses the mark. We, we, uh, we worked with a donor one time that they found one of their major donors had bought a winery and they were very excited. They found the winery, they bought a bottle of wine, they were gonna bring the wine to the winery and, and we broke our data out and we said, don't talk about wine with this person, talk about hiking. And they were like, what? We're like, trust us, talk about hiking. And uh, they were very, uh, the, um, they, they, were, they didn't believe us. And they went and talked about wine, didn't work. The ED went in and talked about hiking and he wouldn't shut up about hiking with the grandkids and all that stuff. And they ended up getting the ask with the hiking, not the wine. The hiking was something that came through understanding emotional data. The wine came through behavioral data. Um, again, it's not, that, it's not that that big data set, those wealth engines aren't valuable. It just gives you incomplete information. This is another data set that helps kind of fill in the gaps in the story that can explain that behavior. 
Well, thank you so much for. I spent, I spent most of my career on this. If you could figure out a way how to assert that, I, I would be very interested in going into business with you, because we are we will be the richest people ever. Well, um, thank you so much, Grant, um, for presenting with us today. This has been very insightful, and I hope everybody else has gained insight as well. We're going to flash two easy questions.